Hi Year 12, we're here for a virtual excursion. You're missing out on all your excursions, so we thought we would bring the camera down and show you what you'd be missing out here at Ash Island. This is, like we've mentioned before, the whole Newcastle Wetland Centre is basically the Great Barrier Reef of Newcastle. So it's one of the most uh, popular excursions we do every year. It's a shame we can't do it this year, but we're going to do the best we can to give you everything you would know from that. The Hunter Wetlands as a whole is over 3,000, I think to be exact, 3,388 hectares, yes, hectares in size. And we're here at Ash Island, which mm. is a, just a small part of that. Yeah, so this is basically a lot of, like it's called like the saltwater site. Over at the uh, uh, Hunter Wetlands Centre, which is basically that way from where we're standing, that's more of the freshwater site and there's a lot of you know, the intermixing and different species of plants and animals and all that sort of stuff. So we're going to have a look at as much of it as we can. So we're just going to walk through and show you some of the stuff you would have seen on your excursion. First thing first, behind us here you can see this beautiful building which I just had to set up in front of. This she is was the, very excited about it. This is the schoolmaster's house and this is one of the spots where they do education field trips um, around the Hunter Wetlands. Annually how, eight... How, how, many, how many students do come here every year? Eight thousand students come wow. to the Hunter Wetlands. Some come here, some go to the Hunter Wetlands Centre which we'll show you later, um, all to learn about this incredible intertidal wetland mm. environment. And as you should know education about an area such as this is a management strategy. A really important management strategy because when we teach people about an ecosystem, they're much more likely to value it, they're much more likely to want to protect it. Exactly. All right, so have a look. We're gonna, uh, gonna go for a wander around. Let's go for a walk. wetlands but something we can see here really important management strategy if we look back at the history of the hunter wetlands it got completely decimated after european colonization first through agriculture and then through industry most of the native vegetation was destroyed so what we're doing now is trying to restore that by replanting a lot of native vegetation since 1996 32,000 plants have been replanted around the hunter wetlands trying to restore some of that uh, native habitat This is my favorite part of the excursion when you turn around and suddenly you are in this amazing wetland environment. Yeah, so the boardwalk basically, we're only 30 or 40 meters from the schoolhouse and they've got this elevated wooden walkway that just goes into the mangrove forest to limit human impacts by things like school groups walking through it of course. So that's a management strategy, an important management strategy, keep people off the mangroves onto this one specific spot. Yeah. So we walk in and you basically, as soon as you walk through the first couple of mangroves, you can actually feel this microclimate. The, the mangrove forest makes it cooler and stiller and quieter. And all of a sudden, you know, 20 meters walking, you feel like you're in a different spot. There are a lot of values associated with the intertidal wetlands, utility value through um, breeding of a lot of uh, marine species. Especially prawns, prawns breed yeah. almost entirely in mangroves. But one, we can't really see that today, we don't really see that in this field trip, but one that you'll see straight away is just the um, aesthetic value. She loves, she loves the aesthetic You actually value. have a lot of tourists come in to the intertidal wetlands to see this because of that aesthetic value. Aesthetic value. <laughs> it's just a really beautiful place to be and it's great for hiking bushwalking and just to come around and uh, have a look. Um, there's a lot of things we notice basically immediately about a mangrove forest but the first and we'll give you a bit of a close-up of these in a minute you will we'll probably cut it in so you can see it right here is the pneumatophores that basically just completely cover the ground so pneumatophores are a very specialized root system of a mangrove tree where essentially the mangrove needs to be partially submerged by salty water but not completely and totally submerged so it sticks out these little almost like little snorkels up through the mud and you have these little sticks everywhere and they're called pneumatophores it's how the uh the, the mangrove takes in oxygen even when it's covered in water when we look at our biophysical interactions part of it is about lithosphere and the soil that we have here where these mangroves are growing is very lacking in oxygen there's mm. not a lot of oxygen at all so that's why it needs to grow these pneumatophores so the pneumatophores actually come up above the soil and above the water so that the plant can get oxygen it's very, very specialized it's very anaerobic soil all right we're going to show you some of those pneumatophores now mm -hmm. and uh, we'll come back and talk to you about a few other things in a moment all right.
So what you can see here, um, all of these little spiky bits coming up are our new metaphors, which I have spelled along the bottom of the screen. What's a new metaphor? <laughs> it's for the, so the plant can breathe. Good one. So we're looking the other way here. Um, what we can see in the mud flats, besides the um, millions of new metaphors, is a bunch of little seedlings and saplings coming up from baby mangrove trees. In fact, so this is one of the processes in our bio, under biogeographical processes called succession. Succession is the new plants growing up and replacing the old plants. The old mangroves growing old, dropping seed pods and being replaced by new mangroves. So what happens is the mangrove trees, each mangrove tree drops thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of seed pods in its life. And very, very few of those actually get a foothold in the mud and actually sprout themselves. Out of the ones that sprout and then compete for light with the other full grown mangroves and the other seedlings, even fewer of those actually becomes a mangrove itself. It's thought that no more than one in a million mangrove seed pods actually gets the chance and grows into a full size mangrove tree itself. But a great example of the process of succession, again, a biogeographical process. As we keep making our way along this boardwalk we've created, you can see some of the things they've put in place to try and educate people about the wetlands. One of the reasons wetlands are so under threat is they don't always look the most appealing and in a lot of cases people don't think that they're worth very much or they're valued very much. So in the past it's been very easy to tear them apart like we did here um, in the Hunter. So what we have here are these little signs like this one here, mangrove forests that aims to teach people that come to the Intertidal Wetlands about why the mangroves are so important and what they actually do for us as a community. So often when I bring students here by about this point in the boardwalk, um, usually I've seen a couple of bits of rubbish stuck in the metaphors, but at the moment I haven't spotted any just quite yet. And this may be an impact of the recent quarantines. We have fewer people coming out here for bushwalking, fewer school excursions, fewer tourists. So it is really important when we look at current issues to look at the impact that COVID-19 is actually having on our ecosystems. And for the most part, it's a pretty positive impact because mm. there's fewer people out here. Yeah, and it's not only that, it's fewer people traveling to and from. So it's having actually a, a pretty significant impact on the carbon emissions that we make globally, which is a, a sort of disconnected roundabout kind of impact rather than directly on the ecosystem, but it's a, it's a factor that should be considered. So we've been looking for rubbish as soon as we walked onto a boardwalk, because as we said, every year we, we find something mm. we stop and talk about it. Yeah. And it's not until now, and we've walked pretty far, but we found our first bit of rubbish. One and bit. A little bit of rubber, so that's yeah. far less than usual, but still a really big human impact on the Hunter Wetlands. Normally at this point in the excursion, we would stop here for a little bit and we would test some of our biophysical conditions. Mm. One of the most important things about doing field work is actually to do the, the physical field work itself. And the purpose of those bits of field work is to investigate both how uh, ecosystems function naturally and has there been any human impacts on them and, and how do we measure how much the ecosystem has been changed by human interaction. So even though you're not out here doing it, it's important that you know about them because it is a question that comes up in the HSC. Um, given a scenario and they'll ask what field work would you perform and how would you perform it. So we're going to run you through a few of the tests that you would do if you were here at the entire wetlands. Mm. So the first thing you're going to do is basically measure the, the factors that are, that are natural to the ecosystem. We're going to measure the temperature, both of the air and the water. What are we going to use to measure temperature? A thermometer. Thermometer. Very good. Very high tech. By, by the way, you do have to know the names of the instruments that you would use to do the testing, not just what testing to do. Okay. The next one we would look at is the humidity, where we would use a hygrometer. 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 Hy it's a fun one. And That's you actually have to do a little bit of math there mm. to work out um, the humidity of the yeah. air. You've got to find the, the, the dry temperature, the wet temperature, and then in between, depending on Yep. Another one we need to look at is the wind speed, what? where we use an, and I always say this wrong, anemometer, 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 anemometer. Some people say anometer. Anemometer. Yeah. Very an good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we see. It's like the one with the little fan that everyone gets and blows into when you shouldn't. So wherever it's very windy or very still, and my class from last year came on probably the windiest day that the education center had seen at the wetlands, so it was very, very windy. If we did it today, Nothing. really still. Very, very still. Yeah. We wouldn't really get a read in. Yep. Uh, we'd also, and this is one of my 
also favourites and favourites of geography students everywhere. We need to measure the turbidity of the water um, because the you know the more murky the water, the less healthy the the ecosystem is. So we'd scoop up, we'd use a turbidity tube. You, you fill it up and then see how far you can see clearly through that water. Yep. Um, another one we always do is the pH for water pH to see if a water is acidic or alkaline. Yep. So you would pull up some water, you'd get given a powder, you'd put the powder on the water and a little colour chart. You need to see what colour it turns. We've also talked about, um, so that that's that's the main the geographical instrumentation that you'd use in the, in the natural the things about the ecosystem you measure. But we could also do things like jot down and measure um, as we walk through how many bits of rubbish you see because that's a really good indication of how uh, much the, the environment is being impacted by human impacts. Field sketches are also really useful especially and what we do at this excursion we go to a couple different sites so look at how the mangroves change because here they're actually very very dense so this is a spot where we've got a lot of mangroves growing and a lot of new metaphors as well so a field sketch might be helpful to show that. Uh, mangrove forests are usually quite um, dominated by one species of plant the mangroves but once we get out further, another bit of uh, our field work we do is to get, what's the name for the metre square thing? Basically, it's the metre square, isn't it? Quadrant. Is right? Quadrant. 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 That's right, I couldn't remember that one. <laughs> um, you'd get basically a plastic tube that is exactly one metre by one metre. You'd put it on the ground and then you would measure in that one square metre how many different species of plant are there and then you name those species. And we do that because if we wanted to find out a species in an area, you're not going to be able to have time to go and count every single species. Mm. So we look at one metre and then we extrapolate for the whole community. Yes. And if you're going to do this properly, the way you're supposed to do is actually to throw it because then you don't have control over where it's landing. You're not taking the little biases of wanting to show you certain spots. Mm. Throw it, you write down what's inside and you may do that 10 times and yeah. then average it out. It's really good with the class group because if you, if you have five or six different groups all do it at once, you get five or six random samplings and you can like figure out good average yeah about what's going to happen in that ecosystem all right let's keep walking okay we're at a, another one of my favorite spots on the boardwalk which is the mud flats the mud flats are a great example of how a little bit of change in elevation can really change the flora the plants um, and plant life in, in the ecosystem. So as we look across here, we're, what we're seeing is the very top edge of the intertidal zone. So the intertidal zone is the difference between the high tide mark and the low tide mark. So as we get to the, the high tide mark, we see along this area here, the pneumatophores and the mangroves basically start to, to die off or to not be there. Then that is replaced by mud flats and the mud flats are just above the high tide mark where there's not enough inundation of salt water for the uh, mangroves to grow. As we get a little bit further up in the, the middle ground here, we have a salt marsh with basically grassy um, grass species that are salt tolerant. And then as we go further higher up, we've got the darker green grass over there is the uh, the Kaikuyu, which is not a salt tolerant plant, so it has to have fresh water. So we know that that part of the little ecosystem, mini ecosystem here is actually not exposed to salt water at all and it's just a fresh water. Uh, over in the foreground, uh, background there too, we have some uh, freshwater trees, the trees that aren't salt, salt tolerant, like casuarinas, um, that are now growing up on the mound because that's basically away from the salt water. So completely different uh, plant life just based on elevation even over the space of 20 to 20 meters here. What have you? Oh, there's a hole. And oh my god. That, yeah, there's trip some, hazard. There's some work that needs to be done on this boardwalk. It's such an important management strategy, but it's not in perfect condition. And you're probably wondering why that is. As a national park, the intertidal wetlands of a hunter wetlands get $7 per hectare every year to maintain. And there's so many other things that need to get done. Um, picking up rubbish that gets left behind, looking after invaded species, as well as the replanting that we saw earlier. So this isn't always a number one priority. One more management strategy uh, that you haven't seen, but is really important, is the fact that there aren't any bins. We always have students when they come here ask, why aren't there any bins? And part of that is got to do with that lack of funding. If they have bins, they're gonna become overflowed and they're gonna have to employ people to 
come and collect all my rubbish. And if I can't do that, which I can't afford to, more rubbish is going to end up in the wetlands. So really important when you visit places like this that you take all of your rubbish with you. Don't leave it in the wetlands. Okay guys, so we're not at Ash Island anymore. We're in another part of the Hunter Wetlands here at the... Wetland Centre, Hunter Wetland Centre. Hunter Wetland Centre. What you can see behind this is actually a man-made pond. So this is part of a restoration process that took place when the environmental protection era came in. Um, this, what you used to see behind us, which has now so many bird species behind us in this pond, used to be two football fields. Mm. And before that, I believe it was a dump. It's been used, it, it goes to show how wetland environments in general were basically completely undervalued for a lot of our history after European colonization. So they basically were thought to be a, you know, a boggy, salty marsh with uh, nothing good about that. Let's chuck rubbish in there and then that didn't work very well at all because it's like the bottom of the catchment so it's always wet and stuff like that and they built some football fields over where the dump was and then they because it was all wet they used to sink and it wasn't very good for playing rugby league at all so finally it was reclaimed back to its natural state now we understand better the utility and the intrinsic value of this environment so they have restored a lot of this land we also have um, a land care group on site that come in and do a lot of the restoration works hundreds of volunteers that work here at the hunter wetlands um, as well as the EEC, Environmental Education Centre, which help to run the excursions that we talked about earlier. 8,000 students a year come through the Hunter Wetlands to learn about this environment. Mm. So let's go have a look. is some green and golden bell frogs. These are a really important species here at the Hunter Wetlands because they are endangered and threatened all across Australia. And the Hunter Wetlands has been a really important site for a captive breeding and then releasing of these green and golden bell frogs. And just this year, we received funding to work with Newcastle University to restore some sites and hopefully breed more of this threatened species, the green and golden bell frog. Pretty cool. What we have here is another threatened species that is being bred at the Hunter Wetlands and they are adorable. He's just checking out my docks. Oh, having a little nipple, mate. This is a freckled duck and they're endangered here in New South Wales. Threatened now, they've uh, improved a little bit the number of these species. Really important work being done by the wetlands here to increase the number of these awesome ducks in New South Wales. That's so cool, you can hear the filtering. So what the um, freckled duck is doing at the moment is actually filtering the food through the water. So these freckled ducks need to be fed um, the grain that they would usually eat in water rather than being uh, fed on dry land. Okay guys, what we've got behind us here is the original home of the freckled ducks that we met earlier. And at the moment, this uh, they've been taken out of this environment because there was a lack of water here, because of a drought that we were facing earlier in the year and the end of last year. But at the moment, they're rehabilitating this area you can see here they're going to be putting a liner down um, filling this up with water and this will be an area where they'll be re-released into this will be eventually their new home uh, if we look over to the right here as well there's also a viewing platform so people come into the wetlands can come here view the freckled duck uh, and learn about that species really exciting though most exciting part mr Sizio and i after showing you the freckled duck learned about the fact that you can actually come here and adopt a duck and the money that you give to the Hunter Wetlands goes towards helping them to breed this threatened species. So we've decided Geography Explained Online is going to adopt, adopt a duck. Adopt a freckled duck. We're adopting a duck. So we'll be bringing you regular updates on how our duck freckled dates. duck is doing. <laughs> hey guys, so it's not just the uh, native wildlife that is uh, protecting the ecosystem. They also do a lot of management with plant life. So in the background here, you can see what was the remnants. Um, this has actually just been um, excavated of an invasive species called torpedo grass. Now torpedo grass grows really, really quickly. You can actually see if you film right over there in the corner behind where the, the, uh, the boardwalk is there, there's a, a bit more over there. And it's an invasive species that really takes over from the, re the rest of the, and, and crowds out the native species. So that's actually been excavated, which is a management strategy, and has been replaced here in the foreground with a lot of uh, native lilies and other native plants trying to crowd out and, and not give an opportunity for that torpedo grass to come back. So management strategies that the wetlands don't just involve wildlife, they also involve a lot of the plant life. So what we've got here is another management strategy called settling ponds. And these are really important for filtering out the urban runoff that would otherwise end up in our main ponds of the wetlands. 
So if we look back, we can see a real distinct difference in the colour between the three ponds that we have here. I'm going to show you a drone footage of this in a moment. So that back, very back pond is where a lot of urban runoff will run into when there are rain events. That will then settle and be filtered by some of the vegetation that is there. It will then filter into this pond here, settle even more and be filtered even more. Then into the third pond before it then finds its way into the main ponds at the wetland centre. Getting a lot rid of a lot of the sediment and runoff from that urban area when it rains. strategy here this is the egret hike right in the middle of this of the wetland you might have seen it on the drone footage already now what this is is a three-story high platform where people can come along look out of the windows and watch the bird life so a lot of the people who visit the wetlands are bird enthusiasts so they can come up here and watch the birds and the birds don't even know you're up here you can watch them doing whatever they get up to now why is this the management strategy Education is one of our categories of management strategy. If anything that educates the public more about the ecosystem and helps drive tourism, helps people understand the ecosystem and how it works, and the better we understand the ecosystem, the better we are to manage it and look after it. We've got another management strategy here. It is called what we call a flow control gate. So the stormwater comes in from the wetlands from over that direction, and it flows into this pond. It flows underneath this bridge here and into the main system. Now, what we've got here is a gate that kind of blocks any water flow and that can actually control how much water flows into the pond at any one time. This is for a couple of reasons. First, they can stop too much water getting in any one spot, but a lot of times they'll shut it to let the pond over this side dry out and therefore um, do two things, re-oxygenate the soil that's been covered in water for a long period of time, but also if some species of grasses are getting in there because of all that water, draining the pond for a while kills off all those grasses, those, those invasive species, and then they let the pond fill back up again and the native species are the only thing left to take back over. So it's a management strategy for a couple of purposes. The other thing you can see behind us here is this viewing platform, specifically designed so people can come and watch do some bird watching. Really important management strategy because it keeps people off the wetlands. We know tourists are going to use this site. Remember, management strategy is all about balancing the needs of society and the needs of the ecosystem. So by having this one spot where people can come, it stops them just trampling through the whole ecosystem. So yet another management strategy here at the, uh, at the wetlands. We see a couple over uh, dead trees over in the in the background now. We even see uh, an ibis at the top. Ibis I think it was, yeah, an ibis at the top of that tree. Now. Uh, what happens is a lot of these um, egrets will bring in the tops of these trees, roost in the tops of these trees, make nests out of the material from the trees. They actually pull off so much of the vegetation that over time the trees actually die. So one of the management strategies at the, at the, at the centre is the, um, they've got a grant to plant, um, was it 100? 2,000 melaleuca trees over this site to replace the trees that have been damaged and, and killed off by the roosting birds. You can see over here to my right is a management strategy that was really important when the water levels were really low during the recent drought. Um, so these plastic containers were put out at all of the ponds and filled with water to make sure that the bird life and the wildlife around the area had plenty to drink even when the water levels were really low. And you notice the bits of wood in there so they can get in and out. Oh, cool. And get access in and out. Yep. Okay. Here we have one of the most important management strategies in the whole uh, environment. Um, we've got pretty much the entire wetland system is ringed by these kind of strange looking fences. That what they are is a soft top fence and you'll notice that it sort of it calls right over on itself. And if you get the top here, it kind of just really bounces around. There's, like, there's the, the posts end only there and you've got this wire overhang. The reason for that is because we're in the middle of a residential area really, there's a lot of domestic animals around, especially cats. So cats will try to climb over it because this whole environment is filled with birds. So smorgasbord for a cat, right? So they climb over, that bends and folds and they cat just falls back on the ground and goes, oh well, gets bored and goes somewhere else. 
but also we've got dogs and foxes are an issue here as well. So the fence doesn't just curl over at the top. It actually is dug down into the ground. It doesn't just stop at ground level. So if a dog or a fox comes along and tries to burrow underneath it, it basically can't dig a deep enough hole because the wire goes under the ground as well. Really ingenious way of trying to, of keeping these domestic pets out. They also have cameras that monitor sections of the fence to see if any animals are trying to get in. And they have some staff who actually come along and, and check for, for holes and gaps in the fence quite often as well. So really effective management strategy keeping domestic animals out. So what we have here, yet another man management strategy, we have over the back there, we have all this fresh water that is drained down from the, the entire catchment. It is all fresh water behind us here. Now what we have under our feet is a little drain that goes under and you can see over the other side of our the impressive uh, golf buggy here we have uh, a tributary to the Hun River that's brackish water that's tidal there's a lot of salt water in that and you can see the pneumatophores of the mangroves in the foreground there as well so what this is doing is basically and when Sammy treks in here like the rugged and intrepid geographer that she is Sammy Owen Sammy Owen <laughs> you can see that the water level behind the gate is much higher than the water level on the other side of the gate that is actually keeping a fresh water in the system and is basically helping drought proof the, the entire wetlands area hey guys this is our last shot out here at hunter wetlands we have had just the best time out here shooting for you guys unfortunate that you weren't with us this year yeah you would have loved it what you can see behind us is the hunter wetland center another really important management Can you, see, the roof? can you see the solar panels? <laughs> They've got like 90 solar panels. That's like three times more than me, but it's fine because they're a big, bigger building. It's really good. Solar panels, get them. We just want to extend a huge thank you to all of the volunteers here at Hunter Wetlands. I reckon they have the best volunteers in the world. They have been the most helpful people in the world to us over the last two days. Super generous with their time showing us everything we learned so much that we didn't even know about the different things that they do and the different ways that they manage the ecosystem and they've, they've done it just all with no notice just we came out and they were like yep we'll show you everything they've been fantastic just because you guys didn't come in here for field work doesn't mean you can't come to the hunter wetlands you can come anytime go for a bushwalk go and see all of the things we've talked about and I strongly recommend that you do that there's volunteer opportunities out here you can do things like we've done like adopting a duck a freckled duck we, a freckle, we own a freckled duck well we don't own it we sponsor it but it's our duck it's <laughs> the geography explained online duck now you can do that kind of thing you can volunteer you can donate money they they the entire wetland system everything that you've seen today operates just on donations from the public so if you can help out please do make sure you guys like and subscribe for more geography content also if you want to learn more about the freckled duck that we and we as we, geography explain you online, all have ownership of the freckled duck have adopted head on over to our instagram at geography underscore explained underscore online we're gonna we have to figure out a name for the duck so we might run a poll like the get Make some suggestions in the comments about what we should name our duck and we'll have a vote. Awesome guys, we'll see you next week for some more Geography Explained Online. See you, dear squad. Okay, no video. <laughs> There's our first blue one. <laughs> okay. You can see here, really important management. Okay guys, what we've got behind us here is the original habitat for the speckled ducks that we Freckle. looked at. Oh, freckled duck. Again. 